once you start trying to interpret your anatomy as a clinical neuroanatomy, it becomes a correlative clinical neuroanatomy, translational clinical neuroanatomy. Things completely change their perspective. You understand? So let's talk about anterior cervical fixation, the indications, uh, technical tips, and complications. So um, basically, we say that oh, everybody is getting old, but sometimes you know these patients have cervical myelopathy, and we think they are getting old. You know. So we know that uh, uh, what are the indications for anterior cervical dissection? All of you, I think, know the difference between Smith-Robinson and a Clovert's technique. So basically, they're just names of two scientists. Smith-Robinson is just putting in a wedge graft, right? And Clovert means that Clovert was another famous scientist, a neurosurgeon. So what he did was he had a cylinder. So what you do is you first put the cylinder, take a dowel of tissue, right? Dowel of tissue from the iliac crest, and you put it at the cervical spine and just uh, kind of. Uh, drill it through, manually drill it through. So th exactly the same size dowel is taken out from the cervical spine. So then this dowel you put it there. So that's the clover technique. Smith's Robinson on the other hand means you drill and then take a wedge of bone and fix it there. So th th that's the difference between clover and Smith Robinson. Both of them are equally useful. And uh, so therefore what are the indications? Of course you all know this, these indications. One is osteophytosis, disc and single or multiple level radiculopathy. And uh, if there you are talking about radiculopathy, then there has to be, when would you operate? If there is a persistent neurological deficit, progressive neurological deficit, if there is a static neurological deficit but with severe radicular pain, that is your indication. And of course, there has to be a clinical radiological correlation. So these are your indications for surgery for this. Uh, another very interesting thing is that uh, if you review the literature on this, I mean, I'm just going to the next level because I, I'm sure you all of you know about cervical dystrophy. So the important thing is that they found out that rather than you know doing a copectomy, a long segment copectomy, uh, spinal stability was better maintained and there was less chances of kyphotic deformity developing by doing a multi-segmental dissectomy rather than doing a long segment copectomy. So unless there is something which is pressing from behind the body, if there are osteophytes or multiple discs at multiple level, then a lot of people recommend multiple level disectomy with osteophyte removal rather than doing a long segment copectomy. So when would you not do a vertebectomy? So if you are doing a copectomy, anything more than three segments. So anything less than three segments, you could do a copectomy. But anything more than three segments, then I think it's much better to go from the posterior approach, do a laminoplasty if there is kyphosis or a laminectomy, I mean, depending on what it is. But definitely, definitely, with a long segment uh, compression, canal stenosis, no copectomy. Less than three segments, that's the recommended thing right now. And of course, we all know the other indications. We have an ossified posterior longitudinal ligament, different discs, tumors, fracture subluxations, you know, this, so you have a fracture subluxation. All of them will require plating, right? Ah, so now we come back to this. This is my favorite quote, you know. <laughs> so this is a very interesting thing. Yes. So now what we need to do is to actually go back and plan the surgery, right? Before we actually do the surgery. So coming on to this, you know, correlative anatomy. What the very interesting thing is, if you look at the vertebral artery, so vertebral artery goes through the foramen transversarium here, right? But if you actually look at the vertebral body and look at the groove of the vertebral artery, there's a very interesting thing that you will observe. Where will you actually injure the vertebral artery in a copectomy or in a disectomy? At what point will you injure? When you start your surgery, when you end your surgery, or in the middle of your surgery? The vertebral artery is right in the middle between the anterior and the posterior bodies, right? You just see the groove. So there are two points at which you can injure it. One is when you're using your monopolar to actually dissect off the longus coli here. And when you dissect off the longus coli here and the, your monopolar goes here inside, that's when you injure it. And the second point where you injure is when you're drilling it and you're standing on one side and the drill goes oblique, <coughs> breaches the cortex at the <coughs> middle of the vertebral body and goes laterally. That's where your vertebral body is. So although you will see the vertebral artery when you are actually doing osteophyte removal right at the depth, the greatest chance of its injury are at the middle level when it is directly lateral to it. Right? Just remember that. So when you are actually doing 
a corporate you must be continuously aware of the midline so that's that's one important thing so you have to define that right that, that's the second thing that you need to do then the other thing is where is the oncovertebral joint so that's another very important thing where is the oncovertebral joint so so zygapper fusel joint is simple facet joints okay oncovertebral joints are these you know the edges of the vertebral body and why are they important why are they important so one is that the second thing is osteophytosis always occurs at this point why does osteophytosis actually occur so in an unstable spine it's trying to become more stable but the only problem is either it impinges into the intervertebral foramina or it impinges backwards and causes cord compression right so is that clear so this is all correlative in your anatomy you know right and the other very important thing is i mean when you are actually doing surgery when you are actually doing surgery please look at the range of movements you know because sometimes what will happen is there will be bony ankylosis at multiple levels and along with bony ankylosis multiple that will the point where there is a disc prolapse will be the only point which is moving the post operatively the patient says what is the what is the complaint with the commonest complaint with the patient will make when you fuse such a spine what is there's only one movement there's a bony ankylosis c3 4 5 bony ankylosis 1 2 so you have to prognosticate you have to tell the person so you must remember the range of movement and another is short neck this is a big mess because if there's a short neck there's a big mess because then you need to give extension and a lot so these are small practical points which you need to look at you know now supposing there is what are the major continuity one is a severe osteoporosis right definitely you need to be careful the second is some trauma tracheoesophageal trauma there is a mild fistula or something infection that's a second but then you need to also look at the red herrings what do you mean by red herrings so these are false these are false things you think of something and it's actually not that you understand so you think of cervical spondylosis it's not really cervical spondylosis right so what are those things if you get fasciculations if you get disproportionate wasting right then if you are getting weakness much more than tightness that's a red herring right then very important thing hundreds of patients i have you know seen patient making a mistake short shuffling steps with less arm clearance and asymmetry so always look at their arm clearance a patient with cervical spondylosis will not have any difficulty in arm clearance unless there is weakness of the arms right decrease arm clearance with short shuffling steps so gait is not only lower limbs it's also upper limbs very very important right that's one thing the second thing is joint pains red herring you know you must make sure there is red then step ladder deficits that's a that's a sign you will get some osteophyte somewhere but it might be indicative of in in surgical terms even an avm some bleed within this then some cerebellar or central cord signs you know you know that and sudden weakness with minor trauma look for what sudden weakness with minor trauma what do you look for cv junction atlanto axial dislocation right and of course if there is pain pain will never happen that's a red herring do you have not gone a contrast study done right so if you get a contrast study done you will get enhancement there so that's a tuberculosis or rheumatoid or whatever so these are red herrings you must always remember all these when you're diagnosing cervix of course we all know about the usual stuff so i won't talk about it but let's talk about the pavlov's ratio what is the pavlov's ratio pavlov's ratio canal body ratio okay not body canal canal body ratio so canal body ratio it's usually one right so or, or 0.7 to 0.8 i mean you know that's that's the thing the other thing is what you really need to look at whenever there is an osteophytosis is either a static or a dynamic diameter and what is a static diameter what's a dynamic diameter so static diameter is from here to here from here to here body to spinal laminar line or the basi spinous line this will never change never never change what will change is the dynamic diameter what is the dynamic diameter from here to here the posterior part the inferior most part and the posterior part of the border here to the uppermost part of the spinal lamellar line of the vertebra below and this inflection extension will definitely change so always look at dynamic diameter when you are looking at osteophytosis right the other very very common mistake which everybody makes so this is the base spine and this is the facet so this part in between is the lamina 
So the canal extends from here to here. Don't say the canal is narrow by looking at this point and operate wrongly. The canal extends from here to here. Right? This other important thing is Ishihara index, which is the curvature. Curvature. I mean, you just look it up. I won't go into detail, but you must know that there is an actually an objective way of assessing spinal curvature. Look it up and I'll, I'll you know. So, of course, uh, what you need to do is that when you're looking at an MRI, what are the common mistakes that you make? Common mistakes that you make. Diagnosing cervical spondylolytic myelopathy when there is a sagittal plane deformity. What do you mean by a sagittal plane deformity? So, somebody has a torticollis. Okay. Now, what you're seeing is that when you're taking a sagittal section, at some points, you have a mid-plane section. And at some points, you have a, a parasitical uh, section in the same section. But you think, oh, there is spondylotic myelopathy without assessing the coronal images because which are not there and without actually looking at the patient who has a scoliosis which is less than 30 degrees. So you can't actually see them without their, uh, I mean, unless you remove the clothes, right? Just make sure there is no scoliosis, right? One important point. The second, second thing is taking two thick sections. That's the second mistake. The radiologist doesn't want to give you too many sections, okay? So you will miss out an osteophyte or a disc. Take thin sections of radio. If required, ask him to make thin sections at that particular level. When you're doing a clinical examination, you must always write your point of suspicion, your clinical level of suspicion. There is the importance of the clinical examination. You say, this is C5 myelopathy. Please look at C5, 6 or look at 4, 5, whatever, right? You must specify this. That, then they look at it carefully, right? That's a very important thing. So now, when would you actually go in for a 360 degree fusion? Say so sometimes, you know, if there is severe osteoporosis, if there is significant kyphotic deformity, significant kyphotic deformity, one side fusion will not work, right? And then, of course, there are several risk factors for non-union. Somebody is on glucocorticoids, for example, for you, somebody is on glucocorticoids for rheumatoid arthritis, severe rheumatoid arthritis, glucocorticoids for a long time. You need to actually do a, a complex long segment fusion, otherwise short segment fusions don't work for these patients. Right? So you must be aware of the fact uh, that you know, these are segments which will require long And the other thing is, when would you require a fibular graft rather than an ilia graft? When it's more than three level or long segments. So there, you know, ilia graft, it will curve, so you will not be able to you mold it into place. So, and then, of course, we talk about the incisions. So we all know these levels. These are the classical levels. You have this thyroid, cricoid, and of course, you can actually see the upper trachea, uh, the trachea, you can actually palpate and you can, so you have these levels. So this is what we, we are. Now I'll just show you a video of the operative steps and then highlight all the points in the operative steps. So there's a single, there's a copectomy here, right? And there's a compression, right? Two level compression because not only one, but two, but you see the cord, it's completely narrowed here. So we just did a so now a small, very small incision. You don't need a long incision because you can actually undermine the edges and you get a very good space there. You seldom have to use a vertical incision. Seldom have to use, your horizontal is enough. The important thing is that, you know, platysma has to be, you know, excised. You must make sure that you have undermined it adequately. Then you get a huge space there, huge space there, right? So that's the second step. Define the sternocleidomastoid, palpate the carotid artery, you know that, right? So you palpate the carotid artery and then just medial to that, tracheostephal space. Now here is the importance of an anesthetist. So if he's your friend, then he will give an adequate relaxation. And when you are putting those retractors there, if there is adequate relaxation, then the patient will not develop any dysphagia or hoarseness of voice. You understand? And the second thing is to actually go quite above and below and create space between these muscles, trachea esophageal muscle, the paratracheal muscles and between the sternocleidomastoid and the carotid sheath laterally. Create adequate space and then open the prevertebral fascia and see for both longus coli. So now here is the importance of the midline because if you have an OPLL, you will not do a total job unless you define your midline, right? So here you must actually define the longus coli and just create adequate space for yourself. There's another reason why you need to create adequate space for yourself. If you have adequate space for yourself, when you're putting your retractors, then you don't know how much the pressure there is on the trachea and esophagus. And if the relaxation disappears, then there's a, going to be a significant pressure without your even realizing it. So now you see both these uh, bodies, define them, localize them. And once you do that, 
make sure that you are in the midline and then you start doing when you're drilling you know, don't worry about the bleeding all you have to do is you have to create a gutter which is a minimum of 1.8 to 2.5 I and mean, that's the range of the gutter and make sure that you have pillars on opposite sides right this is very important and make sure that you are beyond the disc spaces on both sides this is very very important because you might leave a little bit of osteophyte or a disc above and below and and then of course and the depth there are two ways of assessing depth one is go on doing a disectomy when you are doing a disectomy you know your depth you know your depth every time you reach a point go do a little more disectomy go to the next step the other way what is the other way of doing it as soon as the trabecular bone disappears you will get an absolutely white cortical bone and the bleeding disappears so then you know you are almost reached the dura right and then of course you just put in a graft and the plates and the principles of putting the plates i'll just explain in a minute so then the whole thing has to look absolutely bloodless later on and please 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 i mean i'm very conservative about this but put in a drain because you know you don't know that one patient who develops a small collection here and develops sudden respiratory distress and if your resident is not uh, you know sharp enough he's going to miss it and you might lose that patient and especially with a long segment copectomy it's always better to put in a drain and just take it out the next day right now there are two issues associated with just putting a graft without putting in a plate one is that there is graft subsidence over a period of time now what is graft subsidence what happens is that the edges when you have removed the cortical bones then it kind of compresses itself on the graft and the graft goes into the vertebral body right so that's known as graft subsidence and that takes place over a period of time right now the problem is that this plate helps in load sharing which means that a part of the load is transmitted through the graft that you have in the center and part of the load is transmitted through the plate that you have on the side so that helps in load sharing and that is why even when you have done a very good uh, grafting there you need some kind of load sharing uh, equipment by by putting in a plate the second very important thing is that try and not put rigid constructs which means what is a rigid construct rigid means you put in a screw and it stays in place it doesn't move about now the problem with that is that if this this is not wide enough this is not wide enough you know many of the local companies will make those rigid ones which are which do not move up and down when there is graft subsidence what will happen is that the screw does not have the ability to go up and down with the subsidence so what happens it, it loosens you understand then of course what are the complication avoidance methods of the problems that you face of course trachea you see the recurrent laryngeal nerve and superior laryngeal nerve what is the best way to avoid this complication don't see the nerve okay don't see the nerve so you you don't see the nerve so you know where it is but don't see it okay so that's the best way to and then of course vertebral artery i have already told you so two places where the vertebral artery can get injured are here so it's actually quite in the middle not quite lateral right not not deep down it's quite in the middle and then neurological injury one is as soon as the trabecular bone is over and the cortical bone begins it becomes all shiny so that's when you need to change to a diamond drill plenty of irrigation so that that's where you do shouldn't cause any injury and usually there will be a posterior longitudinal ligament behind but still you need to make sure that you don't injure the bone the second is of course at the last part when it's a thin bone use a kerosin sponge now two common mistakes one is i've seen people they don't make the bone thin enough and they use a larger kerosin sponge the head of the kerosin sponge has to be the smallest possible so what you are doing is only removing a very very thin transparent shell of bone without any effort and you're not putting the foot of the kerosin sponge deep into it because that's where you cause injury especially the nerve root injury that's where you know you'll there sudden monoparesis or something is because of that the other very important thing is this is a very very important point this is not a usual disc situation where it's a soft disc and you can just remove it but if there is an ossified posterior longitudinal ligament and there is an asymmetrical ossified posterior longitudinal ligament what happens is that at one point there is a lot of compression and on the other point there is less compression and if you are drilling uniformly right if you are drilling uniformly what will happen is that soon at the point of less compression the dura will prolapse out once that prolapses out then it is impossible to reach the point of maximum compression so read the radiology 
go to the point of maximum compression first, make it uniform and then come to the dura. This is very, very important because with OPLL, this is a big problem. You know, if all those people who are experienced in doing OPLL will immediately identify with what I am saying. The other very important thing is you make the gutter too narrow. This is a very, very important problem. You make the gutter too narrow and the bone doesn't fit and you can't go in. Make sure your gutter is wide enough. A wide gutter is very, very good. It's very easy to do work with a wide gutter. Never work with a very narrow gutter, right? And the third point is that if in an OPLL, you find that the bone is not getting removed from the dura, either you can remove it with the dura and then put in a fat with a fibrin glue and put a bone graft over it, that is one way. Or the other is you just leave a little floating bone there. Just leave a floating bone there and that works very well. But usually you remove the bone because sometimes it gets ossified again. So it's much better to remove it than not to remove it. But if it is not getting removed, just leave the floating bone there. It works very well, right? Now, what are the commonest problems which cause plate extrusion, right? One is that you keep the plate away from the vertebral body. This is the commonest because what happens is as soon as you keep it away, the screw loosens and this comes out. This is a very, very common problem which I say. The second is that when you actually put the screw is directed downwards. It's always a compressive force there. So that plate is providing a compressive force. So they have to go up and they have to go down. Is that clear? These are, these are two very, very important reasons why the plate doesn't. And the third is that the length of the screw is not adequate. Right? So it has to be of adequate length that it reaches up to <coughs> nearly the posterior margin. Right? This is, this is, so you have to measure all these things beforehand. The other thing is graft extrusion. Common problem. In your mind, what do you think is the, are the common causes of graft extrusion? So one important thing is, see one very, very important thing why it comes is that you try to take a very long length. Don't, just don't do that because what will happen is you artificially try to force it into it. And as soon as the patient flexes a little, it kind of comes out. Right? So the very important thing is that the length has to be just right, okay, so that you put it, put it in place, just snugly fix it into place. That's a very common problem. And the second is, the width is not enough. When the width is not enough, then, you know, it's a very narrow thing and you try to, either it breaks or it kind of slips out. And so these are two very, very common problems. By which these are very simple problems, but they are very common problems. And the third very common problem is, that it's not a tricortical graft because it is not providing strength, so it will break, it will fr get fractured. So these are three common, very common problems which are, which are responsible for this. So you see that this is, was an OPLL here, right? And this is how we went. <laughs> and we left this, okay? Yeah, we left this huge thing there, right? And this is a classical point. So you must know where the midline is, and if you're working from one side, you will naturally drill on the opposite side. You'll naturally drill on the opposite side. Another very important thing is dysphagia hoarseness. Your anesthetist is not your friend. <laughs> you know, proper relaxation. You won't know because you know the thing is under retractor. The whole trachea esophagus on one side and the, uh, on the other side. So that is one. You know, you must make sure that the adequate relaxation. You know, the second is adequate exposure because what happens is sometimes you know you have not exposed vertically adequately and then you are trying to pull. So just dissecting between facial planes <coughs> makes a lot of difference to reach the point. And like I told you, you know, you need a tricortical graft there. Finally, the last two points that uh, I'd like to mention. In a child, when you think that the child is lying supine post-operatively and you don't want the child to be having a position of flexion of the head because, you know, that's the worst position for patients who have some kind of cervical problem. It's very, very important for you to understand that there is a disproportion between the head and the torso. And the head is larger than the torso when a child is less than nine years of age. So even when you're putting a child supine, there is flexion of the head. And so what you need to do is to elevate the body a little so that the child is actually in extension. This is one important point. Any craniovertebral junction, any cervical spine, you must remember this fact, especially in a child, right? The second very important thing is immobilization. I'm sorry for this slide, but this is a very, very precious slide for me. So in 1977, there was this guy called Jackson, who actually uh, looked at all the external orthosis and the degree and the freedoms of movement which is provided by each of them despite placement. 
and you will be surprised to know that with a Philadelphia collar that you put place, it's almost 45 degrees of movement are still permissible by a Philadelphia collar. And a sterno-occipito-mandibular brace still provides 40% of movement. And a four-post brace still provides this movement. So the only two 